this is a module that is called entertainment industry and professional practice. Mm -hmm. So it's just about it's a requirement where we just have to kind of build our professional portfolio. And part of that involves talking to a professional in the industry. Okay. So you were actually my first choice based on your website because we have similar styles. So I'm glad you. Okay. Glad similar. You, you mean playing style? Yeah, and yeah, and just aspirations and things like that. So obviously the the best place to start is is talking about how you actually got into this 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 line of work from from the time you started to where you're at now. Mm -hmm. so how did that happen? Well, I moved down to London when I was about 18. I'm originally from the Shetland Islands, and you know, my first break in in terms of session work because it depends what you what you call session work. A lot of people have different uses for the term session work. A lot of people, when they say session musician, just mean freelancer, really. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, traditionally speaking, I th uh, as far as I understand it, session musician is somebody who gets hired to do recording sessions, you know? Mm. So you go, you know, you, you like, the, like the Funk Brothers or, um, you know, in, in Motown or, <laughs> or people like that, you know? Yeah. People who are really hired, just they're going in all the time, you know, doing the, these sessions. And uh, a lot of people will say that scene doesn't really exist anymore. And it certainly doesn't exist nearly to the extent like that it did in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know? Um, it just, it's just not there. Um, so nowadays, when people say session musician, um, it's just a posh way of saying freelance musician. Most of the time, nine times out of ten, when you, mm. when you when you hear someone say that, so they mean, well, you know, they may do the occasional recording session. They do maybe um, maybe some gigs, some tours, some one-off gigs, uh, that sort of thing with with a, a signed artist, usually. Mm. That, that people mean session musician there. Um, some people think, you know, maybe you're doing movie scores. Um, sometimes you're doing, I mean, some people who just play in covers bands call themselves session musicians. So it's kind of hard to, to say exactly when, when you say session work. Um, I kind of think as a, I think of myself as, as a freelancer more right, than yeah. more than a session guy, although I do do a lot of recordings. Um, and I do a lot of pop tours and things like that, but I kind of see it a bit more as a freelancer, really, these days. Because I don't know if that, I don't know if session, that kind of regular session work really exists in the same way it used to, it used to exist. Sure. So you just, you're basically a musician and you basically make yourself available. Um, I make myself available. Yeah, I suppose you could put it that way. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but how I got started was I, I came down uh, to London about that about that time and started playing in all kinds of bands, started playing for upcoming artists, started playing for covers bands, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in those early days, I didn't want to teach at all. And I didn't teach in, f until about, until I was about 24 or so. Mm -hmm. So I didn't teach for a long time because I wanted to, um, I didn't really want to be comfortable, financially comfortable, because I felt that would take away a lot of my, you know, my drive, my motivation. I'm not sure if it would have would have or not, but sure, okay. I wanted to play, you know, and I wanted to be earning my money playing, and I wanted to uh, be forced to generate income from that income stream. So I did, and my first sort of proper break, um, I suppose, in in session work, if we want to call it that, was um, at 21. I went on tour with uh, Leon Jackson who won X Factor at mm -hmm. that point. So he had his, you know, his number one album and all that business and he he went on a UK tour. So I I went on that tour. Um, I, it's kind of a funny story how I got that gig, but um, it's like a lot of things. But anyway, uh, so I did that tour and then straight after that, I did Shane Ward, um, who's another X Factor guy. Yeah. And then from there, with those sorts of things under my belt and on my CV, it, it just sort of, things just kind of rolled on. But certainly, my, that was my first break. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is is the uh, how you got those gigs a long story? Then it's just a combination of many things. Yeah, it's um. So that's yeah, quite it's, a quite a good gig to have, actually. Yeah, it was it was a great gig to have at that time in my career, certainly, mm -hmm. yeah, um, because it's sort of. Uh, I mean, it's you know, it's just a. It's, it's just a regular pop gig really but 
at that time in my peer group, um, people, you know, we weren't getting those kind of gigs at that time. So there was kind of a, a big break for me and it was a break also in my peer group. My, you know, a lot of my peers and I've, you know, gone on to do lots and lots of sessions now bigger than those. But, um, at that time it was, it was something, uh, something of a break for me. And I was, you know, I was very excited about it, but how did I get it? Well, to be honest with you, it was just doing whatever work I could do. There's a uh, drummer who, who uh, passed away recently, Ricky Lawson. And one of his phrases was, he only turns down his collar. You know, <laughs> in other words, he always, he always takes the gigs. And certainly at that time, you know, I was taking every gig I could. So that was lots of cover gigs. I have my own trio, my own quartet, my own duo, plus, you know, playing for other people in, other, in their covers bands, working with artists when I could get a hold of them, you know, when, when, when they would hire me, you know, not signed artists, but, uh, you know, up and coming artists, that sort of thing, uh, you know, singer songwriters or, you know, hip hop people or R and B, you know, singers or that sort of thing. And just doing whatever you can to be in that scene. And I try to surround myself with like-minded musicians, you know, guys who are, who had similar goals to me, um, were really good players. Try to, and I learned a lot from the people I surrounded myself. Mm. Try to get around guys who were really the best I could find at my, you know, around my kind of age, and uh, you know, really, really some extremely talented musicians who got gone on to do some great, great things. And being around those guys, you learn from each other, and you get sharp and your we- your strengths, you know, improve their weaknesses and. Yeah. Their, their strengths challenge your weaknesses and for, you're forced to sort of raise your game, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I just did loads of that and, you know, played, played uh, you know, gospel choirs and did, just did, you know, did whatever I could really to get as much work as I could. And really, uh, the one thing, uh, the thing at the end of the day is if, that I realized during that time was, it, well, I realized that after I got the break, which was the reason I was going in, the reason I played guitar in the first place was because of the joy of playing the guitar. Mm. Because there were, I mean, there were other reasons underlying it, but the reason I chose to express the things I get out of guitar playing with the guitar um, was because, you know, I just love to do it. And so I was happy doing those gigs and I really loved doing those things. At the same time, I was very ambitious very driven and I really had goals that I wanted to achieve by the time I was 30 but I as it happened I got my break at 21 so I achieved most of them by 21 22 mm. but after that I just realized you know it's just for me it's just about playing the guitar and there's no real difference between um, a big pop tour like the one we described and a covers gig in a bar especially if you've got great musicians with you if you've got good musicians it doesn't matter because you're basically doing the same thing you're holding a guitar strumming chords playing guitar solos you know making uh, guitar solo faces you know whatever <laughs> singing back vocals whatever yeah. and it's the same thing whether you're playing at Wembley Arena or you're playing in the local pub really so yeah anyway that's a bit of a tangent but um, no, that's yeah, so that's how I got it so that that network and then you know someone needed a guitar player um, I met a guy who fixed those gigs I did a, a covers gig with him and he's impressed with my playing and my repertoire and uh, I, I knew he was on those gigs. So I said to him, asked him about those gigs. And I said, I really, that's something I'd really love to do one day. You know, and I asked him just, I didn't think he would give me a gig. I, I was asking about it, just saying, oh, I've heard you did this gig. Wow, that's really great. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's something I'd like to do one day. You know, what's, you know, what's it like? And just that sort of thing. Hmm. And so when, it, when he needed a guitar player, one of his guys was, I think it was out with LD, he was out with El Devo, his usual guitar player. And like the next two guys on the list were doing something else, you know, or didn't pick up their phones or whatever it is. And so I was sort of call number five or six. In fact, he called somebody, a friend of mine that I was living with at the time and said, hey, do you have any recommendations for guitar players, you know? And he said, well, what about Steve? And he went, oh, yeah, I forgot about him. Oh, yeah, Steve. And I got the gig that way. Wow, yeah. So just knowing people and doing lots of gigs and coming in contact with them uh, and then the opportunities present themselves, you know? Mm. Get networking, basically. Yeah, yeah. Net- networking, um, kind of networking in a sense of basically being about being about your business, regardless of whether or not you know re- whether you have permission to be or not. 
so I was I was making my own bands, getting my own gigs, doing my own stuff, and I always find it easier if you want to say connect with a musician who you feel has got some sort of you know I don't know he's doing something you'd like to be doing. Mm. You know, the, the best thing you can do is offer him a paid gig, a well-paid gig. Yeah. And then he'll come play on your gig and then you can, you know, you, you can connect with him that way. So it's not networking in the sense of giving out business cards and, yeah. you know, yeah. like hanging out with people um, as much as you can and being the guy who just never fucking goes away. It's about, you know, being about your business, having your own buzz, doing, you know, creating your own scene, creating your own clique and doing your own thing. And then, you know, you're positioning yourself really the best you can uh, for opportunities to come. So, yeah. Hmm. So, um, on the subject of qualifications, then I mean, it sounds like you got gigs mainly from just you know friends asking you and, and just asking around, making it happen. But are there are there any aspects of your qualifications that have helped you get work? Um. Not in and of themselves, no. Mm. I mean, generally, people play down, in my experience or my observation, people play down having gone to a music college or anything like that. Mm. Generally, or in a university, generally because, unless you're in the classical world where it's a bit different or you're in the yeah. jazz world and you've been to the academy or something, generally people play it down um, for a few different reasons, I think, but... No, I don't think there are any necessary qualifications. What it does give you is a ready-made network, and that's very hard to replicate um, in such an easy way. So you're all studying together, and you know you have right away a huge network of musicians to work with, and you have access to mentors in the in the teachers. That's assuming the teachers are, you know, are any good, and assuming they actually have a career you want to replicate. You know, some of the guys don't. So th that's very good, and. It def you definitely learn an enormous amount if you apply yourself. It's very possible to go through a music college and come out probably a worse guitar player than you went in. You know, it's very possible. But that's not really the fault of the music college or the system. It's if you go and apply yourself, you can really bring your playing on in terms of you know all sorts of things. You know, chord knowledge, theory knowledge, uh, reading, uh, whatever it is. Just experience of playing, exposure to more ex more uh, older musicians, that sort of thing. So the but the piece of paper you get at the end of it is worth it's not really worth anything. Mm. If you want to teach later on, at, you know, if you want to you know continue the disease and teach another a music college yourself, then yeah, you need something like that, and then you need a masters or a PGC or something like that. Yeah. But in terms of being a, a live player, um, I don't think the piece of paper has any. And no one's ever, no one's ever asked me for a qualification, uh -huh. and it rarely comes up. People occasionally ask, "Did you study somewhere?" and you know, I've heard people who I know have studied places just dismiss it and brush it under the carpet. You know, hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. It's just, I think it's just it's just not it's not cool, is it? I, it's cool. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe so. You know. Well, it's not that it's not cool. What I, what I think it is is it's not um, it's not a certain. It doesn't mean anything. You can go into, like I said, you can go into those places and graduate from those places, and. It's not a stamp of, unless it's somewhere like the academy, it's not a stamp of quality. Just because no. you graduate with your degree from X place, you know, it just, it's not, you know, we don't have, apart from the academy, we don't have places like Berkeley College of Music over here. So it's mm. not, someone graduates from there, you know, they're probably going to be fairly good. But it's not really the same over here. So you can say, oh, I study at this place. And people will be like, well, that doesn't tell me anything about you. You know, you could be great. Because great people come out of there, you could be really terrible. Because the really terrible people come out of there as well. Um. So you're talking about the work itself. Yeah. yeah. This is the next one down. What are the biggest challenges that you face on a on a day to day basis, and then on the other side of that, the rewards you get out of it? Well, I think the biggest challenge is. Um, the uncertainty of it, I think. Um, so you have to have, or you or you will very soon develop, or you'll quit, a tolerance for risk, uncertainty, and insecurity in terms of what's coming next. Mm. Um, I mean, these days, there are very few jobs that are truly secure, you know, anyway. But certainly it's a bit more apparent as a musician because 
Whereas, you know, unless you learn how to feed yourself, generate your own income, which I think is an essential skill if you want to sustain a career through the times when people aren't giving you gigs, which does happen sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, when's the next gig coming from? How is my career progressing? What will things look like in five years' time? You have to really be intrinsically motivated, motivated from inside, uh, you know, to pursue your own goals for your own reasons. Because there's nobody out there, there's no established career path, there's nobody out there managing your career, there's no, you know, board to impress to get promoted or anything like that. Yeah. So that can be uh, that can be very draining and wearing emotionally on, I think, uh, on people, that insecurity. The rewards, on the other hand, and so, um, so just to continue the biggest challenges, in fact, so that also comes down to, you know, you might see some of your friends who are in day jobs or whatever, other kind of work, they may save up buying houses, you know, doing all that kind of thing. And, and as you get a bit older, in, unless you're, you know, unless you've been smart about your career and proactive about building your career, you can, you can be in a situation where you're making more or less the same money you were making in your twenties, in your thirties. And that can be, um, that's a bit of a shock for some people. A, a bit of panic seems to set in for people when, you know, after a while and they go, oh my God, you know, how much, you know, uh, my, my friends and, uh, you know, peers are making money and doing this and that and the other and I'm, you know, I'm not progressing at the rate that they are financially. And, you know, that doesn't seem like a big deal when you're, you know, when you're 21, but when you're 32 and, you know, you've got a kid on the way or something like that, mm. it's it seems um, quite a bit more, you know, scary. So I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest challenge where, first of all, where's the work going to come from? And then, you know, and then those are the challenges later on, but the rewards are, you get to play guitar yeah. all the time, yeah, which is pretty cool, or at least a lot of the time. Yeah. So you get to travel. It, well, you know, if you're lucky, you get to travel, uh, you get to create music with great musicians and play with really fantastic players and if you're lucky, you get to be involved with an, uh, an artist or two who are really real artists, real, really talented people. And it's very exciting to be a part of bringing that kind of a vision uh, to life, uh, to, to life, which is pretty awesome. Um, you, it's uh, quite a cool job to mention in a, a pub, you know. <laughs> that's quite a, that's a you know, something of a you know vague reward, but you know, but that's what it is. And you have the freedom, really. Um, to do what you want to do, and if you're if you're passionate about it and you love playing the guitar, and you're able to generate your income, and you're able to you know you're able to sort of do your own thing, and, and you're not looking for somebody else to give you a gig, you're ready to to do your own thing. Then it can be a wonderful career mm. of expressing it, expressing yourself musically, uh, mastering a craft. That's for me. That's a a, a a big reward is the ability to over years just continue to chip away at this instrument and get better and, and better and clear, get clearer and clearer in what I'm saying on the guitar. These sorts of things are are real rewards. Um, you can have financial rewards if you're in a big band. A few of my friends have gone on to be in very, very big bands, some of the biggest bands on the planet. And they have, you know, very... Uh, big financial rewards as well and you can as a session musician certainly make very very nice money um if you're uh you know if you if you happen to get caught up with an artist who does a lot and is big you know and sure you can you can make a ton of money and if you're on a lot of recordings you can make a ton of money from mechanical copyright and things like that um accumulatively over the years so um there's that there's there's that but that's uh, the, whether you make big money or not is kind of you know not a good reason to do it because it's not a sure thing by any means yeah I mean, we can. There's a question further down, which kind of links to that, which is huh? live live work by itself. Is that sustainable as a you know as a source of income, or do you need to do other things? I mean, it's, well, it's not about the money, obviously, but well, I mean, money is money. It's a business, uh, really. You you are a business mm -hmm. when you're a session musician. Um, so you know, it 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 is about the money. Eventually, I mean, there's a part of it that is about the money. It's not all about the money, uh, but it's part, so you need to be able to make money. Otherwise, you can't continue to 
express yourself musically and you know what if you want to work full time as a guitarist you have to be able to support yourself yeah and you have to be able to really make more than you need so that you can put money away and and do you know prepare for those lean years that come or or, or for later in life so it is you know or you need money also to invest if you want five years down the line to make you know you know ed and friends solo album or something you need money to build invest in recording and stuff so just like any business, you need cash flow. Mm. Um, so, is live enough? Well, yeah, it can be. I mean, if you're if you're a live musician, you know, if you're a live session guy for a, an artist that you know you're, is lucky enough to do ton of touring and things, yeah, you you could you could certainly make a living. Or if you wanted to be in a a covers band that gigs, you know, three or four times a week, uh, you could certainly make a living from from live only. But it's not so smart because the industry or your career will often move in sort of interesting waves. So, for instance, just a typical one that everyone says, January, February is typically quite quiet time for gigs. Not always. And um, okay. certainly at the beginning of my career, it was that way. And, and now now it's not that way. But certainly it, I've, I've had January, February's before. In fact, the January, February, before I got that break that I was telling you about mm. uh, when I was 21, I had no gigs at all in January and February. At all, nothing. So I remember New Year's Eve, you know, did, that was my last gig, you know. And I looked at my diary and there was nothing. <laughs> diary. For like, and then nothing came in the diary for like two months. So, you know, that can happen. Um, it's easy to get burned down if you're doing any one thing. So it's nice to have multiple streams of income. It's nice to develop other things. And if you, if you hitch your wagon to... You know, some artist, you know, what if he gets hit by a bus or gets arrested or, or quits or fires you or something like that? Then you're sort of screwed. So, yeah, I guess you could make a living from life, but it'd be very exhausting. And then you also got to think 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, what about when you're 45 or something like that? Are you 55? Do you really want to be out on the road? Yeah. <laughs> you know, all that time? It, you probably think now, yes, I'd love that. That'd be fucking great, you know, on the road all the time. Well, what about hustling for gigs? What about you know carrying your gear to the car and way down and you know, all that kind of stuff? You know, yeah. it's not you don't always have a guitar tech and roadies to set everything up. You know, do you want to do that when you're 55? <laughs> yeah, maybe sometimes you want to basically you want to be able to do live because you want to do live, not because you need to do live. Yeah. And if you have multiple streams of income, then if you teach, it's because you want to teach because you don't need it for your rent. I mean, it helps contribute to your rent, but you don't need it exclusively. And when you go and play live, you're doing it because you want to play live, not because you need it. Mm. And if you have, if you get it right, then you don't need, well, of course, you sort of sometimes do, but you don't need, it's not a job anymore. It's, it doesn't become a job, you know. If you're only playing live, then you've got to always be out there playing live, and it's just, it can be a real drag. Sometimes it's nice to stay at home sure. and teach a couple of lessons or something like that. So. To answer your, I'm, I'm giving you a very long-winded answer, so I'm That's trying great. to give you a lot of material. But yeah. Um, yeah, you can make a living from live, sure. But I mean, why would you want to only make a living from live? Because for myself, also, you know, I, I would just get bored doing the same thing, even just playing guitar. So I have to do other things. You know, I have to. I want to write. I want to be in the studio. I want to do. You know, I, I want to teach. I love to teach as well. I really enjoy. It. I don't do very much, but I love. I love to do it. You know, and I love to, to do other sorts of business ventures and look at other ways of generating income and using my skills to generate income in other ways. It's it's quite fun, you know. And to be honest with you, the stuff that I get out of playing music, the core reasons I love music so much, you know, you can find that satisfaction elsewhere. You know, you can find that sense of expression, that sense of freedom, um, uh, wh whatever your core motivators are to play music, you can find those things elsewhere also in, in other business ventures or other other occupations, other art forms, whatever it could be. So over time, just to keep the music fresh, I I enjoy going out and doing different things. Yeah, switching it up. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And just briefly about, about the way you teach, I notice you do Skype lessons. Yeah. Is that is that all... Do you favour that over... Kind of face to face. No, not really. Um, I I much prefer face to face, mm. but the reason I do that is um, I had people from the U.S. contacting me. Well, one guy visited from the U.S. for business, and he took the opportunity to um, come over for some 
lessons he spent we spent the afternoon uh you know playing just some a guy in the, um, america who enjoyed my music enjoyed my playing and whatnot so he wanted the lesson so we came over and we hung out and i just got to thinking he was saying well you know it's a shame you're not in america blah 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 and i thought yeah that's a good point so i, I just put up i just thought well let's see what happens so i made a you know, uh, made it possible on the website for people to sign up to Skype mm. lessons, just so that people who don't live in London really can, uh, you know, can get in touch. And it's been interesting actually, because sometimes you know I've had a couple of, of people on there who are housebound or disabled oh, okay. or something yeah. like that, and they can't actually. I mean, they wouldn't physically be able to get to me anyway. Mm. And that's um, an unexpectedly satisfying uh, thing to do, you know. Um, just to, just to be able to work with people like that, but you know, it just means that people who don't live here can get in touch. Yeah, it, is, yeah. it does sound like a great idea, actually. Yeah, I'm not the one, first one to think of it. Certainly, a lot of a lot of people do do it mm. um, remote lessons, but yeah, I just put it up there, and you know, so people seem to like it. So yeah, great. So going back to um, the live work. Mm. Are there certain qualities, yeah, I mean, obviously you want to be a likeable person, but are there qualities that are necessary to have or essential, like, personality-wise? Well, there is definitely some broad rules of thumb, you know. I mean, of course, there's all, there are always exceptions to these, you know. There are always guys that you think, how do you, how, how do you get gigs, man? <laughs> but uh, there are always guys like that. But, I mean, some of the basics being punctual... Although that one is rather loosely interpreted in some circles, but certainly uh, being punctual is important. Being prepared mm. um, is important. Um, being the ability to be confident about what you're doing, uh, but without being arrogant or uh, overbearing. Sure. People like confidence because it puts them at ease. If you walk into a recording session, and you're saying, "Oh, thanks so much for booking me." And is that okay? Does that sound okay? And you know, oh, what you know? Do you want a bit more of treble or a bit less treble, or how does this sound? Or if you're a bit too much like that, trying to please too much, then people begin to sort of it. it they lose confidence in you, really. But if you're able to go in and, and and you know, you're able to say, "Oh, this is you know, great track. Okay, this is this is what I think. You know, this is what I want." To well, not you wouldn't necessarily say that because they'll probably tell you, "Well, we want this, this, and this." other times they'll just say go nuts but you have that confidence and you believe in what you're doing and you you know you're playing and you think yeah this is sounding good then it actually puts people at ease a lot of times perception is reality so if you if you're digging it and enjoying it and confident about what you're doing and people will kind of breathe a sigh of relief i once saw a really um very very famous session guitarist in the studio i had the privilege of watching him do a session on one occasion and up to that point that my approach had been to go in and you know try and do my best and you know get the sound perfect and get everything just right and try and nail everything as quickly as possible and be very polite and all that kind of thing but he was just treating everyone in the studio like friends just he was relaxed chilled out he was asking the engineer he asked the engineer to dial up a sound for him and he was basically you know letting people do their job and he was relaxed and totally confident he, this guy's done hundreds if not thousands of sessions so yeah. And he was just totally chill. He had no doubt about his ability as a musician, yeah. as a session musician. You know, he had a CV as long as as long as you can imagine. And that changed. And I watched as people in the room, it was a sigh of relief. Everyone was relaxed. They thought, okay, we're in safe hands here. This guy knows what he's doing. And he basically ran the session, really, in a way. And that is, um, that kind of confidence is good but um so i don't know um so the best qualities i don't know as i say punctuality preparedness uh being friendly to people uh, you know it's it's good to be able to get on with people if you can just being nice to people and being relaxed being able to keep your head under under tight deadlines i've had some ridiculous deadlines for big gigs and you've got no time mm. and, you know to do anything and it's it, it can be very stressful so the ability just to be pretty you know chilled out and a bit zen about that kind of thing is is really useful um you know i suppose exactly what you'd imagine really you know don't be a dick but then there are some people who are consistently late and they're kind of assholes you know and they never learn the songs but they get away with it anyway so you know 
but you know, you, you certainly increase your chances if you're, you know, if you're professional about it. Yeah. And um, you mentioned there about tight deadlines. Yeah. Is that how often are they? Just a case of like you need to learn these songs for the next few days, or do you get a long longer time to do it? Well. Um, the tightest deadline I ever had I was we were playing for a comedian Nigerian comedian in um, a big uh, black tie event big, uh, which was his own event he does this yearly event I think he's Nigerian anyway and we went there and I got the call that morning so I went down to, to play and I didn't know what we were going to play and I was saying what are we going to play and people were kind of like being real evasive and not really telling me <laughs> and this was not, not that long ago, actually, a couple of years ago. And then we went on stage. So we're on stage. The band's there. We stood there on stage. And I'm leaving across to uh, the drummer who got me on the gig. Like, what are we going to play? He just laughed at me. <laughs> I was like, all right, fine. And we began. The show happened. Oh, no. And what ended up happening was the guy would come up to you. The comedian would, came up to me and said, you know, you know, play something sexy or he's, I think he asked me to play something sexy to woo the ladies or something. So I had to play something like romantic or something on the guitar and whatever. So it was kind of that, that kind of thing. But, uh, well, it depends. I mean, sometimes you get stuff in advance, you know, you get the album through, you know, you get the CD through and they tell you to do it. Other times you get a week, other times you get a day, mm. 24 hours. Sometimes you've got to do it that day. It depends. Certainly with budgets, um, you know, with, you know, because the music industry in this current form is, certainly changing and it's it's a shrinking industry not a growing industry yeah so it's not from an investment point of view business point of view not a particularly good industry to get into um unless you're an innovator in some way but uh so you don't have long long rehearsals like you know like you used to there's not the money for it so you might have one day two days on one occasion i was doing a bbc radio one extra live uh, gig which was being televised um on you know bbc and we had two 12-hour days to get the set down. Mm. And on the first day, the someone at the management company had sent us the wrong set. So I, I remember walking to the rehearsal, which started two hours late because um, for various reasons. Brilliant. And I remember uh, walk, you know, saying to the saying to the management, "Oh, there's a lot of you know ex rapper. It doesn't matter who he is, but there's a lot of this rapper on the on the." set is he going to be guesting with us or is he joining us for a lot of the songs i thought you know because there's also a female voice on it and i thought that was the girl and he said and he went white as a sheet i said no there shouldn't be any of him on the on the set so we pressed play and sure enough they'd sent us the, the set list and we'd all learned the set list of the wrong of the wrong guy mm. of the wrong music of the wrong artist so Fantastic. yeah so we all just had to leave then that was that so that was the first day scrapped we got i had to gig that night so i got back at about one or two in the morning Set up till about four or five, learning the new set. Got up about eight, <laughs> and went to to do you know the the ten to ten 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 o'clock morning ten at night rehearsal, and that was and that was it. And then the next day we were up at sort of six or something or five or something ridiculous to get on the on the bus to go the tour bus that is to go to the up to Manchester from London, and then we had you know the whole the whole thing there. So we had really no time at all, twenty four hours to. You know, memorize fairly complex pop arrangements. I mean, they were quite complex for pop, mm -hmm. lots of stuff. So you know, you get that, you get that happening sometimes. It's sometimes it's budget, sometimes it's organizational incompetence, sometimes it's just that people are not available. So you only have a certain amount of time. Right. Yeah. So how often do the deadlines happen? I don't know. Qu you know, quite a bit. You've definitely got to be prepared. The way I look at it is, um, it's a bit of a superstition of mine. But I say, well, if you have time to learn something thoroughly, learn it thoroughly. Because if you imagine the sort of the gods of you know session musicians watching over you, and if you if you learn it thoroughly when you ha when you have the time, and when you don't have the time, you've got you know you've got money in your blag bank <laughs> to you know to pull out. If you blag everything, and you're it's like spending your savings, and when you really need them, uh, they won't be there. Yeah. You know, so that's how I look at it. So when I have time, I learn it, and when I don't have time, you just blag it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, obviously, in order to do that anyway, you have to be quite a competent musician. Yeah. But you mentioned on your site that you can sight read. Is that something you found to be, you know, an essential part of it? Well, 
it depends on the gig, you know. For, I've never had to read on a pop gig, and I'm typically on a pop gig the only person who can read. Mm. Um, not even sight read, just read anything. That that's not uncommon. Um, but so you don't need it for pop, really. Um, however, I've uh, I've done a lot of musicals and I've yeah. done a lot of orchestral work, yeah, that's what I was and you absolutely need to read yeah. for that. Otherwise, you're you're screwed, you know. Um, and I, one occasion I was called, the first movie score I ever did, I was called about 11.30 at night, and this Indian voice said, you know, can you be in the studio tomorrow at 10 a.m.? And I said, um, yeah, sure, what, you know, what is it? It's a movie, movie score, um, Bollywood movie score for a, a Lai Raja movie. And I said, okay, sure, I'll go. And I was so nervous uh, on the way to that gig that I had to stop the taxi and I threw up outside the taxi. That's how nervous I was because I was a bit younger and it was my very first movie score I, and I knew it would be full orchestra would be there and I'd have to actually sight read mm. whatever it was. I got there and the piece was in 7-8 at, I think it was about 142 beats per minute. Oh, lovely. So it was fast 7-8. Yeah. Um, and it ended up, funnily enough, as soon as I walked into the studio, I was completely calm and at ease because it's not doing it that's the scary bit. It's the anticipation of doing it that's the scary bit. As soon as I got in there and I had my guitar in my hand, you know, and in fact, I sat there with my guitar and the, and, uh, and the copyist put the sheet in front of me, for which the first time I'd seen it, and the composer walked up to me before I even had my guitar out of my bag and asked me to read it for him. So I took my guitar out of the bag I looked at the sheet and just started reading it, sight reading it. And he was stood over me. And he did that to a lot of the music, orchestral musicians. He went around everybody doing that. And he fired a couple of people who he didn't like the way they interpreted the chart at first okay. sight, you know. Yeah. So that is about as classically, you know, sight reading pressure gig as you can, as you can think of. And uh, yeah, so my reading skills were so important then. But funnily enough, reading is something I learned later in life, you know. I, uh, in you know my early twenties, I just I just decided, you know, I'm just going to learn to read. You know, yeah. so I just started to learn. But yeah, it's come in really useful. I mean, those are gigs that have led to many gigs and led to many opportunities and a lot of income that I would have been unable to accept. I would have had to say, sorry, I can't. You know, I just I'm not capable of reading. Uh, you know, I don't have faith in my reading ability. Mm. Or even worse, you'd show up and. They want you to read and you can't, and then you've got to go home with your tail between your legs, you know, and that can be very damaging. So, um, it's it's not it's certainly not essential. A lot, I know a lot of musicians who have great careers and they can't read, you know, yeah. and the, some of the greatest, most innovative musicians of the last hundred years couldn't read. You know, Jimi Hendrix, for instance. Mm, yeah. But um, these days, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, get it's down to your bow, isn't it? Yeah, it's you know you need every you need every skill you can get, every advantage you can get. So. I don't quite get why you wouldn't do it. It's not that hard. I mean, small, you know, young children can do it. Young children can read music. Um, lots of other people in the world can read music, so why not you? Mm. And with, with some daily practice, you know, your reading can be, get pretty good within, you know, a year or two, something like that. You know, you can, you can get to the point where you're pretty good. In fact, Richard Niles, a producer arranger, once, once told me a story of uh, some musician who couldn't read very well, and he joined, oh, what's that clarinetist band? Um, Benny Goodman's band. And he couldn't read very well. And so, and he asked Benny, how can I improve my reading? I may be getting, I may, I may be getting this story a bit backwards, but I think something along the lines of Benny said to him, well, get a stack of music as high as your desk, and every day take a fresh sheet from that stack, play it, and then toss it in the wastebasket in the next stack play it toss it in the wastebasket by the time you get through the stack you'll be able to read you know so there's no you just got to do it really yeah if you want to get it down hmm. um I mean I think you mentioned this earlier about how obviously with the industry changing it, the, the amount of work you get varies is that something that you've come across a lot like the way you know, how record sales fall and live performance are more significant? Well, I've only really been doing it for 10 years, so mm. uh, I think by the time I got into it, that had already happened. 
Yeah. So I don't know if I've noticed. Uh, I don't think so. A lot of people used to say when I was starting out, oh, you know, we were born in the wrong generation. You know, <laughs> we should have been here 20 years ago, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people would, used to say that. Yeah. And my thought on that was, well, we could have been born in, you know, the Second World War when something like that, when everyone was called up and, you know, musicians were, musicians and every, everybody was just, you know, slaughtered in these massive mm. battles, you know. So I don't think we were born in the wrong generation at all. But uh, some people used to lament the disappearance of the session scene and all that, but I don't know. I think it's a great time to to be a musician if you're innovative, if you're willing to, if you enjoy innovation, and if you enjoy um, the business side, the entrepreneurial side, the uh, exploring of different ideas and generating income and all that kind of stuff. If you enjoy that kind of thing, if that sounds interesting, then it's a great great time to do it because with the internet and all this stuff you know we've got so many opportunities um but so no i can't say i've noticed the change of the industry has affected me that much because i haven't really been around i wouldn't say long enough to really witness mm. a, a big zeitgeist shift like that um i think we're almost, I, so what other advice like would you give specifically me but you know anyone starting out in being a freelance musician or someone <laughs> trying to break into it okay well the first thing I would say is to <clears throat> sit down and really think about and write down specific goals, specific things you want to do. Uh, they can be dream goals, you know. They could be whatever, but real, like what in the ideal world? Because you know, people do become rock stars. That does happen. So if you want to be a rock star, you know, or something like that, or a big star, okay, if that's what you want, then. If that's what you'd like, then write that down mm. and then start working on that with every hour in the day, you know, every day. And, you know, you, you know, it's, it's risky. It's tricky. It's not likely, but people do it. Yeah. I've told you already, I, I've, you know, friends of mine have gone on to be in huge bands, huge bands that are taking over the whole world. And I, you know, I used to hang out with those guys when they were broke musicians the same as me. And I remember having discussions with some of those guys where I'd say, yeah, I'm going to do the session route because I, that's personally what I love to do. And they were saying, well, I remember it was a big deal when some of those guys said, I don't want to do session work. I'm going to try and make it in a band. And I remember thinking to myself, you guys are crazy, you know? You want to make it play in a band? No one's going to get paid for anything. You're going to pay in all these shitty bars for the rest of your life and... You know, and then you're going to get older and you're going to just jack it in. You know, you guys are crazy. You know, what what a drag, you know. <laughs> and now they're, you know, like massive, huge, great, you know, some of the biggest selling artists of all time, mm -hmm. actually, some of these guys. So, and, you know, they did it. You know, it can be done. I've seen regular guys become rock stars, you know. So if that's what you want, then you write it down and go for it. it so if you want to be a session musician, it, that is to say you, you like the idea of touring with, or playing, you know, in the sort of freelance way I've described, great, we'll write that down. And be as specific as possible, you know. I had something like I wanted to, you know, to tour the UK with a number one artist by the time I was 30 or something. I had, I didn't know anything about the industry, so I thought that was a quite a lofty goal. And as, as I've told you, it happened for me very quickly. Yeah. But um, but that was, you know, I was lucky. Um, but, well, luck and, uh, you know, good looks and stuff as well, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, and uh, so be really clear about what you want. And then uh, go for it because there's so many different things you can do in the industry, so many different routes you can go down. Be clear about what you want, and, and then go for it. That's the most important advice. There's lots of other advice, you know. I give all day. Of, you know, surround yourself with great musicians. Yeah. You know, uh, be around like-minded people. If you can live with musicians, then do that. You know, um, you know. But these are the sorts of things that I think, unless you know, they're not unless that occurs to you naturally. If you have to be told, you probably, you know, haven't got what it, what it takes. If you, if you need to be told all the multiple ways that you can increase your chances to become a professional musician, you probably haven't got what it takes to be a professional musician, which is the ability to think for yourself 
and generate your own strategies and work hard without anyone patting you on the back, you know. Mm. Because I had people, you know, close to me even after that first tour. In fact, it got worse after my first big tour. People were saying, okay, well, no, now you're going to get a teaching qualification, <laughs> you know, so you've got some backup. People were saying that to me at that point, you know. Even at that point when I had the the break and I was doing it, you know, I'm like, I'm doing it now. Look, no hands, you know. People would say, well, you know, you've got to get a teaching qualification, you know, that sort of thing. So you're not, you know, you, you might get, you'll get support, sure, but, you know, really it has to come from in yourself. You to, this is what I want. So I'd say be clear about what you want and then, you know, move, move uh, heaven and earth to make it happen. And you can do it. It can be done. People are going to do it. Someone's going to play for Rihanna. You know, if that's what you want to do, someone's going to be the next Mumford and Sons. Yeah, exactly. If that's what you want to do, someone's going to do it. There'll mm. be real people doing that. They're not. They are. They are real people that actually exist and used to be people like you know, you know, you and me. You know, <laughs> before they became massive rock stars and all huge session guys or whatever it is. Mm. So you can do it, but you know, you got to know what you want and go for it. Great. What a place to end. Yeah. T- how about that, eh? <laughs> Well, all right, thank, Ed. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate your time. That's all right. Was that was that what you're looking for? Absolutely. Yeah, I've got loads. Of, well, an hour of stuff. That's great. <laughs>